Hello and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we'll be looking at the media and the role of the media, in particular its coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We're discussing how false and inaccurate media reports has led to a demonisation of Israel around the world, has inflamed public opinion against Israel and in many cases led to an increase in anti-Semitism. And uh, now in the 21st century, uh, battles are no longer won and lost on the battlefield, but they're now won or lost in the media. They're won on the TV screens or in the newspapers or on the radio. And so there's now in this day and age, there's a real battle for truth. And the media is where that truth is being played out. And today I'm joined by Simon uh, Polska, who is the managing editor of uh, Honest Reporting. Uh, Simon, hello and welcome to the Middle Hi. East Report. Nice to be here. Uh, it's good to have you on the programme. Um, Simon, can you tell us a little bit about your background um, living here in, in London with the Jewish community and now uh, living in Israel, making Aliyah and working for Honest Reporting? Right. Um, some 11 years ago, 12 years ago now, um, I was working for the Board of Deputies of British Jews, which is the representative organisation of British Jewry. Um, I was working in the Public Affairs Department at the time, and it was, the, uh, it was around 2000 at the outbreak of the so-called Second Intifada, oh. and we were getting a load of phone calls in from people, um, you know, the BBC is doing this, the Guardian is saying that. It was a real, real shock for the Jewish community, the, the press coverage of Israel at that time. And I got a lot of phone calls from people saying, you know, what are you going to do about this? And it's, it's now I realise it was the wrong question that they were asking. The question really should have been, you know, what can we do about it? Which is why I'm now involved in grassroots activism for Israel. Um, and after the, working for the Board of Deputies, I made Ali, I moved to Israel in 2001. Um, I've worked for a number of other uh, organisations, um, including the IDF spokespersons unit for a very brief amount of time. And uh, I found my way to honest reporting some six years ago and I'm now the managing editor. Excellent. Well, I want to take you back to your time in Israel. What was it like to work in the IDF uh, spokespersons unit? And what does that job entail? And how does Israel communicate to so many foreign journalists based out in Israel that are covering the conflict? Well, I mean, I was not in a position where I was dealing directly with the media. Um, I was working for the public affairs department of the IDF, which involved uh, bringing groups to uh, various military bases, taking them on tours of uh, places such as the security barrier, for instance. Oh. Um, but the IDF spokesperson's unit uh, does a very vital job. Um, it's a very difficult job. Uh, it has to deal with a lot of uh, press calls, uh, journalists wanting information. And of course, unlike the other side, where Palestinian spokespeople will fill the airwaves within minutes with uh, inaccurate information, usually, uh, the IDF, of course, and Israeli spokespeople in general have to think very carefully about what's been going on. They have to get the information correct. Um, you cannot afford to be seen to lie on television. And likewise, you need to give accurate information. So therefore, sometimes it takes longer than you would like uh, in the quest for accuracy. And unfortunately, in that time, we have perhaps a, a golden hour in medical terms where the patient can be saved uh, if uh, treatment is administered quickly. And obviously, uh, in that golden hour, the Palestinian side has tended to get its story out there first. Uh, which really leads you on to your work with Honest Reporting. Can you tell our, our viewers what uh, Honest Reporting does and the reason why Honest Reporting was established? Right. We are the world's largest grassroots organisation dealing with anti-Israel media bias. We have over 150,000 subscribers worldwide. Uh, we, have, we operate essentially from our web address, www.honestreporting.com, and essentially we send out communiques once or twice a week, alerting people to the media bias that we find in the papers, giving some analysis, and more importantly, or just as importantly, mm. giving people the tools to actually take action themselves. Uh, something as simple as giving the, uh, the address, the email address of the letters to the editor of a newspaper or how to complain to the BBC or, or what's the uh, web address for the Ombudsman of the New York Times. And that way grassroots can become involved and active in supporting Israel. And how did honest reporting start in the first place? Well, 
Back in 2000, when there was the outbreak of violence and the press coverage was just absolutely horrific, um, a couple of Jewish students in northwest London, um, they were appalled at what was happening. So they started an email list. They just sent, sent out uh, communiques to their friends, just simple emails. This was back in the day when you know, email was a, perhaps a bit more sophisticated medium of communication. And the list grew and it grew. And eventually, they couldn't handle it any longer. It was becoming really, really big. They handed it over to a, a Jewish outreach organization, which seeded it. And eventually, uh, Honest Reporting became its own independent, uh, charitable status, um, editorial independent. And uh, that's where we are today. It's been functioning now for way over a decade. Oh, we've got, we got a picture to, uh, to show you now. Um, that uh, if you can describe this particular picture here, I think it was back in 2000. Now, I know that the New York Times um, put this on, I think it was the front page of their newspaper, where it gives the impression that here's an Israeli soldier, or, and they describe this as being on the Temple Mount, um, hitting a Palestinian boy. But can you tell us the, the true accuracy or, and the true account of what this picture really represents? Right. Um, this we call the photo that started it all because this was where Honest Reporting had its first major success. Um, this photo, as you said, appeared on the front page of the New York Times back in 2000. And the caption was something along the lines of um, an Israeli policeman and a Palestinian on the Temple Mount. Well, a closer look at the photograph, of course, you can see in the background there's actually a, a gas station and cars. Now, I don't know whether you've ever been on the Temple Mount before. I've been up I've on yes. the Temple Mount and... <laughs> As well, no you know, stations. there's no petrol stations up there and there are no cars up there. And uh, so obviously that was completely incorrect. But the real story behind this was that the so-called Palestinian at the front there is actually Tuvia Grossman, who was a Jewish student from Chicago. He was studying in Jerusalem for the year. He was in a taxi cab with a friend when that taxi was set upon by a mob, a mob of Palestinians who dragged him out of, of the cab and his friend was able to run off, but Tuvia was beaten within inches of his life. And the only reason he was saved was this Israeli border policeman turned up and was able to, to make, disperse the crowd, disperse the mob. Now, um, the next day, Tuvia's father opens his newspaper and sees his son there being portrayed as a Palestinian. And obviously, this was you know, quite outrageous. Mm. And so the story spread, thanks to honest reporting, and the New York Times was forced to issue a correction. But from then on, that was pretty much, as we said, the photo that started it all. But there is a happy ending to that particular story. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, I happened to bump into Tuvia himself. He lives around the corner from me in Israel, and our, both of our young sons go to the same um, after-school activity. And uh, just the other year, on the 10th anniversary of this, um, Tuvia's wife actually phoned us and said, you know, I want to give Tuvia a surprise. Can you track down the border policeman who saved his life? Because he hadn't seen him in 10 years. He didn't know the guy's name, nothing. And thanks to the work of the Israel police, we traced this border policeman to a small Druze village up in the north of Israel. Um, this border policeman was a Druze Arab named Amazing. Gidon. Um, and we reunited them on film, and uh, we've got the, the videos on our website, and it's, uh, you know, it's a very, very touching moment, a uh, very human moment when they're reunited. Yeah. But, but isn't that, I mean, case of this picture that's up here at the moment, uh, and you usually say that uh, a, a picture will tell almost a thousand truths, um, but it's that misconception that, that, that the media want to portray that Israel's the aggressor, and here we are, the Palestinians are the ones being oppressed, and uh, trying to get that type of imagery into the newspapers that puts Israel in such a bad light. Right, I mean, this particular photograph, um, I don't think you even needed the caption um, for people to look at it and automatically assume that that is an Israeli about to beat a Palestinian because that's the framework that uh, people are being fed the whole time about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Mm. And would you say that... Uh the majority of the media in this country are biased towards Israel in terms of their uh, coverage of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict? I think there's different levels of bias. Uh, on one hand, I'm going to bring in the example of the Guardian newspaper, which is openly hostile towards Israel, I would say. And, uh, you know, this is a newspaper where in previous years we've had um, op-eds asking the question, does Israel have a right to exist? 
Um, on the other hand, we have the BBC as well. A lot of people like to complain about the BBC, but the BBC itself is a bit more subtle than that. It's like a drip, drip effect where context is missed out. And just recently, Israel saw um, hundreds of rockets falling on the south of the country, a million Israelis um, having to run to bomb shelters. But, you know, in the eyes of the BBC, you would have to have gone down uh, on their website maybe seven or eight paragraphs before you actually read about that. Um, the, the articles themselves were more about Israeli airstrikes against Palestinian targets, which, have, of course, were terrorist targets. Mm. But the trouble is the news is not put in context. And then the other great danger, particularly with uh, this, this type of reporting, is the um, editorialising. Uh, and uh, saying that this is the conclusions, sure, in conclusions, rather than just presenting the facts as they are. Right. I mean, even there's examples uh, such as a recent one where an Israeli woman was, was stoned in her car in the West Bank. And, you know, for a lot of the media, they look on something like, oh, a stoning of a car as the typical... Uh, Palestinian with the stones against Israel with the tanks, the, the David versus Goliath mm. situation. In fact, you know, a lot of the stones that are used are more like concrete blocks and they can be lethal. And back in 2011, um, an Israeli father and his baby son died after their car was stoned by you know, large blocks, forcing the car off the road. It crashed and they died. These are lethal, lethal weapons. And it's you know, issues of context, that's just, just one example. Um, but even just seeing Israel in terms of fighting a war against, um, against Islamic terrorism, for example, it's, very, it's still not portrayed in that, in that way, in that manner. Mm. We've got uh, a news clip to go to now that portrays Israel as not wanting to make peace. If you get all your information about the Middle East from the media, then you're being led astray. When the media tells you that Israel is not interested in peace, they're ignoring what real Israelis are saying. I want peace. I want peace, of course. We all want peace. Peace. I want peace with the Palestinians. I want peace with the Palestinians. I want peace. I want peace with the Palestinians. I want peace. I want peace with the Palestinians. Peace is what we need. We must have peace. With peace is peace. Peace, peace for children. I want peace between. I want peace. I want peace. I want peace. With I want peace. 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 Just like any other. All six Israeli prime ministers since the signing of the Oslo Accords agreed to establish a Palestinian state, myself included. When the media tells you that Israel is not interested in peace, they're ignoring the actions Israel is taking. Withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, teaching peace and coexistence, and the willingness to recognize a Palestinian state. When the media tells you that Israel is not interested in peace, they're ignoring what each and every Israeli prime minister has been working tirelessly toward at every opportunity. So if Israelis want peace, and their leaders want peace, and Israel acts for peace, then why does the media identify Israel as the obstacle to peace? Are you being informed by the media? or misled by the media. Hello and welcome back to the Middle East Report. That was a good analogy really, because the media is, is essentially, they are like sheep. And the way that uh, the news cir cir circle works is that uh, there will be one story and the rest of the media follow that one story. Uh, very much like sheep. So I think that's a very good analogy of how the media works. Very much so. And, uh, I mean, we can always we can have a good laugh at, uh, you know, the guy chasing a sheep around a forest like that. But, uh, you know, there is a more serious side to things. And that sort of video is the, the type of material that we can put out mm. on, on places like YouTube or Facebook um, to reach a wider audience. 
the audience that's being misled about what, what Israel's real intentions are. And when it comes down to uh, biased reporting, what are the dangers and the implications of uh, such reporting um, on Israel and the Jewish people around the world? Well, as I said before, Israel seems to be the only country in the world where people question its very right to exist. And at the moment, there's a campaign of delegitimization going on, demonization of Israel, which is meant to portray it in the same way that, is, uh, that South African apartheid was. And the whole aim of the campaign against apartheid was to bring down the apartheid regime. Now, in the same way, a lot of Israel's detractors feel that they can do the same thing if they put Israel on the defensive like this and portray it in, in essence the same as an apartheid state. And obviously, uh, I think we need to put things in perspective. Israel's political position is not actually that bad. Um, generally, Israel is supported by a lot of the leaders of the Western world, of the free democratic world. But in any democracy, if the public turns against a particular cause, no politician is going to sacrifice themselves um, for, for Israel's sake if, if it becomes a real hot potato issue. Yeah, and, and this is the case. This is, this is essentially an asymmetric warfare that Israel faces where the Islamists use the power of the media, they use the power of the TV screens either to create a false impression but primarily to um, uh, enrage public opinion against Israel, which will then put pressure on the governments to take a more hostile line towards Israel and adopt more hostile policies uh, and effectively pursue policies that are more pro-Islamist or pro-Palestinian in their agenda. Right, we've seen the last decade or so that uh, the Arab side has realised it cannot be Israel on the battlefield in terms of military. So they've resorted to the media. And even the media can have an effect on uh, military means. Um, we've seen, uh, for example, various campaigns over the last few years where um, maybe one errant missile on the Israeli side, um, even if it actually strikes a terrorist target, if the media is told that there were a bunch of Palestinian civilians in there, Israel is then under a lot of pressure from governments, from the United Nations, from the general public to cease military operations, allowing the enemy time to regroup. Um, and we also see in terms of diplomatic, uh, the diplomatic side of things, uh, for example, the Mavi Marmara incident, the, the flotilla, where one only has to look at the, the situation with Turkey now. Now, one can argue possibly that Turkey was looking for an excuse to uh, wind down its uh, relations, its previously good relations with Israel, and that was a good excuse. But on the other hand, uh, the entire situation became a very, very difficult one for Israel diplomatically and also in the arena of uh, public diplomacy. Mm. Uh, and we also know that Israel's security situation is uh, very precarious. Uh, particularly is that Israel is facing the threat from Hezbollah in the north, Hamas in the south, and also various other Palestinian terrorist organizations, actually in Judea and Samaria as well, right on Israel's borders, uh, and particularly with the threat of missile and rocket attacks. Uh, as we saw with Operation Cast Lead back in 2008 and 2009, Israel had no choice but to go into Gaza to try and destroy the terrorist entity, which is Hamas, to stop them from firing missiles at very vulnerable Jewish communities. Um, and only in recent weeks we've seen a whole increase of rockets and missiles being fired at southern Israel. And yet when Israel goes in to defend herself, she faces huge international condemnation um, through essentially media reporting. And in many cases, there seems to be a correlation, correct me if I'm wrong, with an increase in anti-Semitism. Is that the case? It is the case. I mean, we're looking at a situation of, I suppose, chronological inversion and a lack of context. Now, we all know with the media, if it bleeds, it leads. Now, thankfully, um, not many Israelis have been killed by Palestinian missiles. And there's a good reason for that. It's because Israel takes care of its civilians. Now, one should be asking the question as to why Israelis have to have um, a reinforced room in each of their homes and bomb shelters that they can run to. I mean, this isn't a normal life. But, of course, if people aren't dying, then the media just doesn't report on the rockets that have been falling from Gaza. Over the years, we're talking you know, hundreds and hundreds of them uh, on a regular basis. Then, so the media ignores that. Then Israel eventually takes action to stop the missiles. But Israel is then framed as the aggressor. And, there, and that, of course, distorts the entire story. And in answer to your, uh, 
your issue of the anti of anti-Semitism, yes, of course, it does have a very big effect on things. Now, obviously, uh, a real anti-Semite doesn't need um, Israel uh, or what's going on in the Middle East to hate Jews. And, but, of course, it helps. And, and it also has the effect of, of bringing it into, bringing anti-Semitism into the mainstream oh. because those sort of, uh, those sort of anti-Jewish and anti-Israeli uh, remarks or um, editorials, etc., etc., they then become part of the supposedly acceptable discourse when we discuss what's going on with Israel. And in any, in any conflict situation, we see a rise in the number of anti-Semitic incidents. So whatever happens in Israel does have a very big impact on Jewish communities worldwide. I've got a clip to go to now, and, uh, which is a very amusing clip, but also has a very, very powerful and uh, poignant message. And uh, that message is, what has Israel ever done for peace? Which many of the mainstream media always accuse Israel as being the main obstacle to peace in the Middle East. Correspondents to the region, those of us that have been here a long time, will be more than happy to share with you our expertise so that we can all report in a consistent fashion. Now, the key thing is to emphasize how the Palestinians have worked tirelessly towards peace, but Israel blocks them every single time. I mean, I ask you, what have the Israelis actually ever done for peace in the Middle East? The UN partition plan. What? 1947. They accepted the UN partition plan that the Arabs rejected. Oh yeah, yeah, they did do that, that's true. Yeah. And there's the Sinai. They withdrew from Sinai and made peace with Egypt. Oh yeah, they did make peace with Egypt, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah all right, I'll grant you the UN partition plan and making peace with Egypt, the two things that Israel has done for peace. They made peace with Jordan. Yeah, yeah. Jordan, yeah, I mean, Jordan, that's obvious, isn't it? I mean, you can't make peace with Egypt without making peace with Jordan, but... Apart from the UN partition plan, peace with Egypt and with Jordan, what wow. Withdrawal from Palestinian towns and cities. Removing checkpoints. Provide fresh water and power to the Palestinians. Yeah, 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 yeah. Allowing humanitarian aid into Gaza. Yeah, 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 yeah. Agreeing to recognise a Palestinian state. Dismantled settlements and forcefully removed thousands of Jews from their homes. Yeah, all right, all right, but... Apart from the UN partition plan, peace with Egypt and Jordan, forcefully removing Jews from their homes, providing fresh water and electricity, I ask you, what have the Israelis ever done for the Middle East? Pursued peace? Peace? Oh, shut up! <laughs> And welcome back to the Middle East Report. Um, Simon, that was a very amusing clip there, but it also uh, portrays a very, very important message behind, behind that video, and particularly for foreign correspondents and the way that uh, news has changed now. News media is 24-7. Uh, the days of the uh, four old correspondents being based out uh, in Israel to, to report uh, are becoming a thing of the past now, uh, where there's a big international news story. Uh, newspapers and uh, producers send their journalists there at a moment's notice to cover what's going on. And so many of the uh, journalists coming don't have an understanding of the, the, the history of the region, nor do they have an understanding of the political dynamics. Uh, and so how important is it that journalists come in and are informed and educated um, about the country that they're in? Well, I think it's very important, but obviously you've raised a very important issue here. Uh, a lot of the news bureaus are shutting down or cutting back on their staff. So those journalists who've perhaps been there for three or four years and know the situation on the ground, now that doesn't necessarily mean that they, you know, they're reporting objectively, but yeah. they do have some knowledge at least. We're now getting times when there's, uh, you know, perhaps an incident happens and then a whole flood of reporters flies into Ben Gurion Airport, um, rushes to get their press accreditation, and that's it. They're left to their own devices and they're normally picked up by Palestinians. There are about a dozen organisations near, working near Jerusalem alone working for Palestinians to help fix up 
reporters with uh, stories, uh, obviously, which portray the Palestinian narrative. Um, this is something that we were very, very concerned about. And uh, a number of years ago, we decided that it wasn't enough that honest reporting would be a stick with which to beat the media. We, ha we had to bring in some carrots as well. And we have to start embracing the journalists and actually helping them to get the news stories, not by propaganda. I mean, I actually do believe that Israel has a very, very, uh, very incredible story to tell. And it's one that doesn't need people to start trying to push a particular narrative. If people see both sides of the story and they get, a bigger pic they get the bigger picture, they can make up their own minds. And I think it's very compelling what Israel has to say for itself. Very much so, very much so. But when it, when it comes down to reporting on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, you look at the media coverage around the world, it, it seems that Israel gets far more media coverage than many other conflicts that are going on on around the world and if Israel then for example fights back against a terrorist attack and, and then sadly some Palestinian civilians are killed then that becomes a huge news story around the world yet many conflicts around the world are not even being covered. Um, right, I mean there is a real disproportionate amount of coverage. Yes. Now you could say that obviously there are certain things to do with Israel that make it a very interesting thing for a lot of people. It's obviously the home of the three great world religions and it's been uh, you know, an issue going back now, not just decades, but uh, you know, hundreds of years, really. But there are a lot of structural issues as well. Now, a lot of the international press, they have their bureaus, their Middle East bureaus are in, in Jerusalem. And there's a, it's very obvious why. Israel is a free democratic country where there's freedom of the press and foreign correspondents are able to travel wherever they want, get all the stories they need. Now, if they were to go into Syria, for example, now in previous years, if they'd have gone into Syria, number one, they'd have to get a visa to go in. They'd have had a minder with them. And if they'd have written anything nasty about Bashar al-Assad, that would have been the last time they're going back into, into Syria again. No more reporting from Damascus. And if you're a journalist, one of the most important things you've got is access. If you haven't got access to every other country in the Middle East, because you actually reported fairly on what was going on there, then your boss back in London or New York is going to oh. say, well, sorry, we're bringing you back home because you're no use to us whatsoever. And unfortunately, a lot of journalists try to make sure that they're in they look out for their own interests. And even in the Palestinian territories, there's not a free press there. And a lot of journalists are intimidated. Um, we've seen in the past, even uh, I think one of the best examples was on 9-11, when Palestinians were throwing candies and sweets into the air and you know, celebrating the destruction of the Twin Towers. And a number of um, international media caught these things on film, but those sort of things were confiscated or the Palestinian Authority impressed upon those media outlets not to release the pictures because they're damaging to the Palestinian cause. And the media gave in. I mean, surely one of the major foundations or principles of any news report is accuracy in its reporting and also in truth. So isn't there a great danger then by so many of these media outlets not portraying the truth or believing outright lies are actually then watering down um, the trust between the viewer or the reader and their publication because their reports are seen to be inaccurate? I think that's absolutely true. In the end, this is more than just an issue about the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is an issue about um, proper coverage from your own media outlets, yeah. and the general public deserve better than what they're getting. And when it also comes down to the use of language, use of language is also a very interesting term. I know the BBC very often like to portray Palestinian terrorist organisations like Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad as, uh, as gunmen. And when we think of gunmen, we think of, uh, uh, you know, a farmer or a clay pigeon shooter or someone who goes out shooting for game and not actually someone who's intent on killing innocent civilians uh, and as many innocent civilians as they can. Right, I mean, the classic, the classic terminology really is uh, the so-called Hamas uh, or Palestinian militant. Yeah. Now, you know, any British viewers will remember back to the 70s when there was a militant tendency within within the Labour Party. Um, this, is a, you know, this is a political term, but those sort of militants didn't blow themselves up or start shooting innocent civilians. So there's no sort of uh, equivalence there at all. 
Um, you know, I think the media should be calling a terrorist a terrorist. And what the surprising thing is, uh, the BBC, we mentioned the BBC, um, you know, they'll call these people militants and activists. But if you remember back to uh, the bombing campaigns of the IRA, they were quite happy, the BBC, to call those people terrorists. Yet when they're attacking Jews, they're militants. And there's something seriously wrong there. And even I, I bring up the example, there have been, uh, thankfully, the very rare occasion where um, an Israeli has, has done some criminal act. Um, you know, a number of years ago, there was an example where a deranged soldier went on board an Arab bus and started shooting. Now, the press called him a terrorist, and I had no problem with that at all. You know, as far as I was, was concerned, that was a terrorist act. But if you're going to call um, you know, the odd uh, guy that does this really, really random act a terrorist, then you really should be calling the same people that are doing this day in, day out, week in, week out, call them terrorists as well, because that's what they are. Absolutely. We've got a clip to go to now that looks at Jerusalem and how uh, media reports on Jerusalem have uh, really changed the perception in public opinion on Jerusalem and, and the conflict that's going on in Israel. The media often refer to a place called Arab East Jerusalem. Sometimes we are told that this is a city that was conquered by Israel in 1967, as if that is the only claim Israel has to the city. But let's take a few minutes for some honest reporting. The term Arab East Jerusalem is not historically accurate. We have thousands of years of history of a single undivided city. Look back through all the various chapters in Jerusalem's past, and you will not find a time when Jerusalem was divided into East and West prior to the war with Jordan. We have archaeology, historical accounts, records that prove over 3,000 years of undivided Jewish existence here in Jerusalem. You can go to archaeological digs and find evidence of over 3,000 years of Jewish life. You can find places in the areas that are today called Arab East Jerusalem, where King David lived. The wall behind me is a part of the palace that King David lived in, and yet even the very existence of King David is today being questioned. The fact is that the division of Jerusalem into East and West only began in 1948 with the invasion of the Jordanian army who erected walls here of concrete, barbed wire, and put in minefields. This division only lasted 19 years. We have eyewitness testimony from those whose families lived for generations in what is called Arab East Jerusalem and who were expelled from their homes by the Jordanian army. I was born in 1942 in Old Jerusalem. We were like eight generations at that time. I live in the old city. I am sixth generation of Arab Eliezer Bergman who came to this place on the year 1835. We were evacuated from here, from the old city, with nothing. We only the clothes we wore. We had for many days, we had not we had nothing, we had nothing. Our home, homes were left here with all the furniture, all our possessions. When we left the old city, we were refugees. The, the, the world knows about the Arab refugees of 1948. There were also Jewish refugees, and I was one of them. The last day of uh, the war, which was ceasefire, my, my grandfather brought the last water and the Arab already were on top of the roof of the synagogue and they killed him. For 19 years, we could not get into the old city. Our Jerusalem was divided in two. It's the first time in, his, in the history of Jerusalem that this city was divided. In 1967, the Jordanians fled, Jerusalem was reunited and the walls torn down. Jews could once again return to their holiest places. 
far from creating a new situation of occupation, the war re-established a status quo of an undivided city. Today, few people even know where the dividing line was. Thousands of Jews and Arabs cross the old dividing line every day without even realizing it. Jerusalem is a unified city, despite what the media would have you believe. Yet, with references to East Jerusalem as a separate geographical area, the media are supporting a historically inaccurate myth that undermines the legitimate Israeli claims that are backed by thousands of years of history. The two-city narrative is a myth, it's a lie, and the media are responsible for carrying that core message of the delegitimization campaign against the state of Israel and Jewish residents in the land. To refer to the city as if there are two distinct sides is wrong. What the media call Arab East Jerusalem is really where thousands of years of Jewish history took place. Don't let the media distort the real history of Jerusalem. Welcome back to the Middle East Report. Um, so when we saw Jerusalem, which uh, to many of our Jewish and Christian viewers is, is such a special place, and having visited Israel so many times, you, there's something very, very special uh, about Jerusalem, uh, which is Jewish. And uh, we know that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob gave that to the Jewish people as an internal inheritance, uh, and it's your city. Uh, but clearly, right now, there is a battle that's being waged in the media for Jerusalem. Um, how important is it to get those facts out to the mainstream media outlets that actually Jerusalem is a Jewish city? I think it's very, very important. Um, I mean, as you said, Israel is central to the Jewish... Uh, sorry, Jerusalem is central to the Jewish faith as well as the Christian faith. And we're seeing at the moment Palestinians um, indulging in a form of uh, historical denial of Jewish rights. Um, Jewish history in that region goes back 3,000 years. And essentially, every time the Palestinian side says there was never a Jewish temple on the Temple Mount, they're denying not just Jewish history, but Christian history as well. Um, they're, they're basically saying that Jesus never walked on the Mount. Which we know did. Uh, which does go further in saying how that uh, these groups such as the Islamist groups, want to use Western media in order to um, essentially uh, attack Israel, but not only attack Israel, but delegitimize Israel and weaken her moral authority and also historical rights and claims to the land. Yes, because obviously if Jews are seen to have no historical rights, then the Palestinian narrative will win. That's a false narrative that uh, Jews came from outside of that particular um, particular region and kicked out the indigenous natives, which, which plays into a, I suppose, a left-wing colonialist view of things, um, which is something that uh, at the moment the far left is very, very keen on, on promoting. So it's very, very important that, that Jewish history is emphasised there. And it really doesn't matter whether someone is a believer in God or not. Uh, the simple fact is that I can go into Jerusalem or anywhere in Israel and I can start digging and I will find um, you know, pieces of history uh, going back to my ancestors thousands of years ago as a Jew. And it's an incredible, incredible thing. Yeah, very much so, very much so. But also one of the problems Israel has, isn't it, that uh, the Palestinians have one cent central message theme which is uh, all the results of the Palestinian problems are due to occupation, and then occupation, so-called Israeli occupation of Palestinian lands, lands is used as justification, which is often outlaid in the media, um, for why the, the Israelis are being attacked or a terrorist attack against Israel. Uh, and yet Israel's message is one that's a little bit more complex, primarily to do with the freedom of press and the freedom and democracy Israel has in her, her society. Right. I mean, on one hand, we have the, the issue of, I suppose, occupation, occupation, occupation. Well, if you ask most Israelis, um, they'll, they'll tell you that Israel has withdrawn from territories such as the Gaza Strip with the promise that, you know, peace would come. And all we've seen is rockets coming over. But back to your point about, um, you know, the, the mixed messaging coming from Israel, mm. I always say that Israel's greatest strength is its greatest weakness. I mean its greatest strength is that you know, we're a democracy, but at the same time it means that uh, the message isn't simple. We have a, a government, we have a government of coalition parties, of many different shades of politics, 
And, you know, if, if you're part of the media and you go and interview an Israeli politician, you'll get one, one answer from one part of the government, another view from uh, another part. And in the meantime, the Palestinians are they're very central. They're, they have one, one over, overreaching uh, message that they put out. Israel has multiple messages because, of course, um, is playing, politicians play to their own particular audiences as well, not just to foreign, uh, the foreign public. Mm. Uh, so, of course, it means that we are at something of a disadvantage. However, I would never, never ever sacrifice that. Um, Israel being a, a free liberal democracy with an open press and a lot of self-criticism, I think it's, uh, you know, it's a wonderful thing. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully and I, I know it will continue. Yeah. Um, but surely now, in the 21st century, here we are with a 24-7 news around us through the Internet, through so many new uh, TV channels and news channels. Um, surely, Simon, now's the time that Israel actually stopped relying on the likes of the BBC, Sky, CNN to tell her story in a narrative, that it's time that Israel had her own channel where she could put her views from and give the stories from her perspective in order to outweigh so many of the hostile and false media claims surrounding Israel. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, a lot of people would argue that, that government-sponsored uh, TV stations uh, wouldn't be credible. But on the other hand, we've seen you know, Russia today, uh, France 24, and even, dare I say it, the Iranians playing with, their, with the media as well, with their press TV, which of course isn't credible, but uh, it is a way for Iran to get its message across. And Israel really should be doing the same thing. And it's a, it's a terrible, terrible thing that Israel's own public broadcaster, the IBA, the Israel Broadcasting Authority, fights every year for the funding to keep its English news uh, broadcasting going. And anyone who's involved in public diplomacy can see that this is an absolutely essential part of putting Israel's message across. But unfortunately, it's been neglected. And I think the, the Israeli government are, are hoping, praying that, uh, that some rich uh, philanthropist is going to come along and decide to start, start their own TV station. And in fact, I, th I believe that there are there are efforts towards this, but um, you know, it's very, very slow, and uh, we'll see. Maybe in the future this is going to happen, but at the moment, the Israeli government itself does not have the budget for doing this, mm. even if it would like to see it happen. Yeah, but maybe something on a smaller scale. I mean, you could easily have a channel on Sky, like Revelation, just here in the UK, just uh, with uh, programmes about Israel and uh, Jewish life, get some interesting guests, get some feed, and you could fill up airspace. And you, you know you'd have an audience, you know you'd have a Jewish audience, you know that you'd have a, a, a very sympathetic Christian audience that are pro-Israel, you'd also have a Muslim audience, and then you have people that are intellectually uh, curious to go and find out there, which, which could then result in, uh, in a new channel that really does do a lot of um, Israel's work by communicating the truth of the situation, what's happening. Because so many news reports, especially now, you only get in a two, three minute report about what's happening. Uh, politicians are being in interviewed uh, about the situation on the ground. They have to talk in sound bites. They only get maybe one or two minutes. Um, you know, here's some you get uh, 56 minutes to explain the work of honest reporting, the situation that Israel faces in terms of its media bias against Israel. Um, and this is a way of actually then communicating to a wider audience about the true facts on the ground because it's, that, it's media that's so powerful and so important because that's shaping people's views, it's shaping their opinions, it's shaping what they believe in. And uh, as a channel, we, we passionately believe in Israel and the Jewish people and want to communicate the truth of, that, of what's happening. Uh, and this is why the Middle East reports in, in place. No, you're absolutely right. And Revelation TV is a model for this. And, uh, you know, it's almost sad that uh, here I am on Revelation TV uh, rather than on a, an either an Israeli station or a Jewish one broadcasting to the, the world. Um, and, you know, we can only hope that this is going to be the case in the future. On the other hand, um, one can say that the role of TV stations is becoming less and less mm -hmm. with the Internet anyway and citizen journalism and social media. Um, and that's something that Honest Reporting is very active in. Um, just placing, you saw some of the videos before that were played here. Um, there is a serious side to them because by posting them on places like YouTube, uh, they get out to a wider audience, not just supporters of Israel. I mean, it's probably a bit of a sad fact that some people actually do get their news from YouTube, believe it or not, uh, for, rightly or wrongly. So, 
if enough people click on a video like that, so it r rises uh, up the rankings, gets on the front page of the news section, for example, and people are looking for interesting things. And this is something we're heavily involved in now. And I do believe that people, uh, there's an 80% of the public out there who have no fixed opinion on, on Israel or the Middle East conflict. Mm. And just by putting out uh, decent content, these people can be persuaded one way or another. Uh, we did it uh, not that long ago with a slideshow uh, looking at how to uh, rebut the argument that Israel employs disproportionate force. Mm. We put this on the SlideShare website. It's a very, very popular SlideShare um, slide sharing website. And it got um, you know, nearly 100,000 uh, hits. And these were not from people who were subscribed to Honest Reporting. These were people who just happened to see a particularly well-thought-out piece of content. And this is very much the way forward. And social media is something that we, we believe we are having some success with at the moment. Mm. We've got a clip to go to now. It's our, our final clip of the programme that looks at uh, um, Hamas in Gaza and how they've manipulated so much of the uh, Western media to actually put Israel and portray Israel in a bad light. The Israelis had shot dead the Hamas gunmen and then systematically destroyed all the Palestinians. Images broadcast from Gaza are misleading. Since the beginning of Operation Cast Lead, the Israel Defense Forces have been targeting Hamas stockpiles of weaponry, including rockets, RPGs and tons of high explosives. These military targets have been placed either within or in close proximity to residential buildings and infrastructure in what is one of the most densely populated cities in the world. This is no accident, it is doctrine. Seen here is a battle plan captured during the present operation, illustrating how the seemingly innocent streets and narrow alleyways are in fact booby-trapped with powerful explosive devices. When detonated, devastating damage would be brought upon the surrounding buildings. Here, Hamas aimed to compound the devastation by placing its explosive device in a petrol station, using it to trigger a far greater explosion that would destroy everything within its vicinity. Hamas doctrine has turned the residential areas of the Gaza Strip into one enormous minefield, wreaking havoc in the heart of civilian dwellings with every detonation. Another basic element of Hamas combat doctrine is the systematic use of protected buildings such as mosques and schools for launching attacks and storing weapons. Such acts are a blatant breach of international law. Furthermore, having violated the sanctity of such protected areas, Hamas renders them legitimate military targets. The Israeli Air Force has proven its skills in pinpointing targets time and again, targeting single vehicles with little, if any, collateral damage to bystanders and slipping rockets into the windows of Hamas headquarters, leaving adjacent apartments and their inhabitants intact. They've struck at those rockets. The explosions you see are the rocket caches. In the case of the targeting of weapon stockpiles, hidden in residential buildings and explosive tunnels, it is the secondary explosions of Hamas hidden catches and booby traps that bring about devastation to property, infrastructure and human lives. Again, this is no accident. It is premeditated Hamas doctrine. Hello and welcome back to the Middle East Report. Um, Simon, I think we're in the latter stages of the program now, but uh, how can our viewers get involved who are passionate for truth, who are passionate advocates for Israel, uh, who want to defend Israel against what is perceived this media bias against Israel and the Jewish people? We really rely on numbers here, and I would urge all your viewers to go to www.honestreporting.com and sign up. It's free. You know, there's no, no obligation at all. And firstly, I'd say educate yourselves, but also take action. We give uh, the analyses, we give the, the incidents of media bias so that people can respond. I'm also extremely active in social media, as I said. Mm. So, for example, something like Facebook, 
Um, even just spreading a video like that from the IDF or some of Honest Reporting's content means that it spreads further to people who aren't necessarily involved or informed. Um, just, just a simple click on some of this content will make it rise up the Google search rankings so that it's easier to find. And I mean, we've had some you know, very good successes on, uh, on uh, social media. Just recently, for example, um, Twitter. It's, uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of your viewers know it's something to do with 140 characters. People tweet things. And in the recent uh, violence that went on where Israelis were under rocket fire, um, someone tweeted a photograph of a bloodied um, Gazan child uh, being carried into a hospital and claimed that this was what was going on in Gaza. Now, a number of other um, people on Twitter exposed the fact that this was a photo that went back a couple of years of a Palestinian girl who'd been killed in a car crash. So not only was it nothing to do with the IDF whatsoever, um, it was also from the wrong time. Um, and the IDF did a very good job of actually putting this information out there. We dug a little bit deeper. We found out that the person who did the tweet was working for the United Nations. And this was quite frankly shocking. And we launched a petition about this and things have culminated in the Israeli ambassador to the UN, Ron Prosser, actually calling for this person's removal from the United Nations. And you know, this is just a very, very small example of how enough people uh, putting pressure in the right places uh, can actually have an impact. And this is really what we, what we live for, what we mm. work for uh, you know, with honest reporting. This is how we operate and we need, we need the people to get behind us in order to achieve results such as that. Uh, Simon, I just want to thank you so much for being my uh, guest today on the Middle East Report, and uh, I want to thank you all for watching. As you see, that there is a media war. There is a, a media battle being uh, won on the uh, fort in the airwaves uh, that's 24-7, and that's a battle for truth. And that we have uh, an important role to play in educating ourselves about what is really happening on the ground, what is happening in Israel, what is happening in the Middle East, and uh, how can we get that information. So it's important that all of us stay informed, we know what's happening, and we can be ambassadors for Israel and ambassadors for truth. And I just want to thank you for watching the Middle East Report today. And uh, good night and goodbye. Is the place where I feel safe, where I'm supposed to be? I feel you holding me where we may be, where all can be. What you feel inside. What we feel is right So I will